Hello and welcome back to the 10th lecture on this course on chemical process design. In this second part of lecture 10, we're going to examine some rules of thumb that you can use to develop your plant and plot layout. A good layout starts by considering safety first and foremost. We'll discuss hazard segregation and exclusion zones, and also remind you about the importance of minimising inventories of stored materials. Remember, what you don't have can't leak. Part of layout a plant safely is providing adequate access and egress in case of an emergency, and we'll discuss how this can be done. After considerations of safety, we'll consider the process. The correct functioning of many items of process equipment will rely on their placement with respect to other items of process equipment. For example, using gravity feeds for material flows, static heads to prevent pump cavitation, and sufficient lengths of straight pipe to allow accurate flow measurement. We will also mention specific guidance to allow safe access to vertical equipment such as distillation columns, as well as introduce elements of a process for which specific legal guidance exists. We'll conclude by highlighting some layout considerations that exist for both construction and for maintenance. So when you start to think about layout, you need some information. Your information comes from two main sources. Firstly, your process flow diagram, since this graphically shows how different items of equipment are connected to one another. And also sizing information, which you can obtain either from your front end engineering design stage, your feed stage, or from your detail design stage. The way in which you can use this information is many and varied. What you're aiming for is to try and figure out the correct placement or a correct placement of unit operations with respect to one another. So you can do this in a CAD package. You can draw scale drawings of all your items of equipment and start to move them around. However, if you're not already familiar with the CAD package, the learning curve to do that can be quite steep. So don't forget the old ways in which it can be done. Making little cardboard cutouts to scale and just simply moving them around on a piece of paper. Let's start by thinking how we do that layout process. And we're going to start, as mentioned, by considering safety first and foremost. So some items of process equipment require exclusion zones and, as such, are governed by quite strict legislation. So if you're dealing with things like fired heaters or furnaces, like flares, storage tanks or compressors, then you need to be aware that there is a minimum distance that they can be placed to other items of process equipment and to buildings. The exact distances will depend on what those other items of process equipment are and what is in the buildings in question. I'm not going to give you a comprehensive list of exclusion zones here, but if you refer to Sean Moran's excellent book and look in Appendix C2, you'll find a comprehensive list there. Once you've established the items of process equipment that are subject to exclusion zone, a good rule of thumb then is to separate the toxic and flammable parts of the process from the remainder of the plant, again for good reasons of safety. When you do this, remember to limit your inventory of hazardous materials. This cannot be said often enough, because if you look back at, for example, the Bhopal disaster in India, one of the primary causes of that was unnecessary storage of toxic material, and thousands of people died as a result. Remember always what you don't have can't leak. You're going to have electrical items of equipment on your plant. But remember that if you've also got flammable atmospheres present or the potential for flammable atmosphere present, then there's going to be specific types of electrical equipment that can and cannot be used, which all are ruled by your electrical zoning classifications. Sometimes your design are going to have um, duplicate parts of equipment. You might decide, for example, that it's simply too unsafe to build one big reactor and all the various items of equipment associated with it, and so you have two parallel reaction trains. Consider putting them on different plots and attempt to reduce the items of equipment on any one plot. At the bottom of this slide in that purple box are some key legislations and standards that govern the things we've been talking about. I'm not going to go through those in detail, and there's going to be similar boxes on other slides I'm going to put on my whiteboard as we go through this part of this lecture. Another key part of thinking about safety is what happens in the worst case, and you hope it never happens, but you have to always have to design for it, what happens in an emergency. The first and most important thing is getting people out. So you need to think about providing sufficient escape access. No workplace should be between 12 and 45 metres away from an exit. Dead end routes should not exceed 8 metres long. Emergency assembly points should be at least 100 metres upwind of any hazard. 
and think that in an emergency, visibility is likely to be marred by smoke and or other vapours. So emergency lighting and emergency route marking should be provided such that it is unequivocally obvious where an escape route is and where it is leading. Think of the volume of people that you need to get out in case of an emergency. The walkways and emergency routes should be big enough to cope with that, and so they should be about 1.2 metres wide. When you've established your first layout, estimate the escape times from all areas for people. Now remember, in an emergency situation, the movement of people is often going to be inhibited by protective clothing, maybe by breathing apparatus or by chemical protection suits, and so they're not going to be as agile as they would be under normal conditions, so escape times will be longer. Once you've established what your escape times are, you then need to appraise whether those escape times are about right, or whether they are too long, and whether more access needs providing. Now, one of the things that can lead to an emergency scenario is fire. And if there's a fire, obviously there needs to be firefighting access to control and hopefully to extinguish said fire. So if you think about fire trucks coming in to extinguish a blaze, their water jets can only go so far. And so this places a logical upper limit on how large a plot of plant should be, 100 metres by 200 metres. You should be able to access that plot on all four sides and there should be 15 metres between different plots and between buildings. Fire trucks need access to water, which is going to be provided by fire hydrants, and these should be spaced no greater than 60 metres apart. Under all circumstances, electrical switchgear must remain accessible because that is likely to be a vital part of safely shutting down a piece of plant. Also, if there's going to be a large firefighting process going on, think of where the fire water goes. Millions and millions of litres of water will be poured onto a flaming site which will often by that point contain toxic and or flammable materials that will be entrained within that fire water. Where is it going to drain to to prevent an environmental catastrophe? The usual provision is to provide a fire water pond into which that water can drain. Other things you need to think about. Slips, trips and falls are one of the biggest causes of lost time at work. These can range from the trivial, from the seemingly trivial, if you trip over, say, a curb, or items of cabling, or items of waste that are lying around, through to the very, very seemingly looking serious, which is falling off very tall items, such as distillation columns or other items of process equipment which require vertical access. So if you're working from heights, then there is specific guidance covering that, and we will cover some of that in a few slides' time. You need to provide containment and bunding to prevent liquid spillage from unit operation. So if you look at tanks and tank farms and other items of plant that routinely handle liquids, they will have little walls around them that will contain any leaks. We also need to think about, about halting the spread of fire if the worst happens. So separating plots, separating materials and separating equipment is one of the ways in which you can arrest the spread of an inferno. So let's think about some rules of thumb to lay out the process now. You've looked at all the safety considerations, now we need to think about how the process works. So we need to group together high pressure equipment for safety and for maintenance. We need to group together high temperature equipment also for safety and for maintenance, but also as well for ease of heat integration. Remember that we don't want to be wasting energy and it is very usual to have fairly complex heat integration schemes in any piece of plant. Now. Of course, there's going to be pipework and ductwork connecting items of equipment together. And don't forget, this can be in a variety of different sizes. Pipes can range from the incredibly small, a few inch diameter, through to the actually very, very big. And I've put the photograph of the steelworks back on the board for you to remind you how big pipework can be. The dotted box on that photograph shows some of the large duct and pipework that conveys carbon monoxide rich gas into some of the steel making process. And these pipes are vast and require specific parts of site for them to actually run down. So if you assume that these pipes are small, you'll end up with a layout that just isn't real realistic. Think about how your process equipment works. Can you use gravity to assist the flow of materials from one item of equipment to another, especially if it's items of powder or solid flow? Remember that pumps can't and must not cavitate, and so you need to provide positive suction head, very often by providing a vertical head, a static head of liquid to give you that positive pressure. 
If you've got vacuum systems, such as jet ejectors, somehow, once you've pulled a vacuum, you need to recover the pressures back to atmospheric, say, for example, any condensate. And very often, that's provided by a long vertical piece of pipework, where, again, static head can provide that pressure increase. And again, by laying out your process effectively by putting jet ejectors, for example, on the top floor of your plant, you can easily provide that static head. Also think about measurement. Flow meters are incredibly sensitive pieces of equipment and very often need defined straight lengths of pipe run before them if they're to function accurately. Let's now think about vertical equipment. The picture that I've put on the whiteboard is of a distillation train on a plant and look at this picture in detail. Look at each of these distillation columns and you'll see ladders, you'll see platforms, you'll see handrails. You'll also see that these platforms are spaced an even distance vertically one above the other. And if you look at the ladders, you'll find that ladders very rarely run in from one straight run to go into another straight run directly beneath it, beneath a platform. Imagine what would happen if somebody fell and there wasn't a means of arresting that fall. So stringent layout requirements are present for safe vertical access. Platforms are required for vessels three and a half metres above the ground or two metres above the ground for va access to valves. Platforms are placed about three metres apart vertically and handrails should be 1.1 metres high. Stairways are always preferable to ladders if space allows because they are inherently safer. Walkways should be 0.8 metres wide for one person 1.2 metres wide for two people, and two metres wide for up to six people. Now, considering vertical ladders, they shouldn't run for any more than three metres without a landing, or any longer than nine metres without a landing for tall items such as columns. Ladders also need back cages and safety hoops such that people can clip on and wear a safety harness just in case they have a fall. And these back cages and safety hoops should be present for ladders taller than 1.5 metres. You will find that specific legal guidance exists for some items of process equipment. So I'm going to put a few items of process equipment on the board for you as examples and also give you reference to some of the pieces of legislation that govern their layout. We can start with toxic and flammable liquid storage sites. In the UK, these are governed by HSG 176, which is a publication from the UK's Health and Safety Executive. The HSG 176 is on the open government licence, so I've put a copy for you on Moodle to have a look through. And the excerpt here is an excerpt of some of the recommendations for layout of flammable storage tanks. If you're dealing with bulk chlorine installations, for example on a chloralkali site, again HSG 1, HSD 28 within the UK governs their layout and their operation. And again, due to the Open Government Licence, I've put a copy of HSG 28 for you on Moodle for your perusal. Other installations also require specific guidance, such as the design and construction of liquefied petroleum gas installations. This is governed by API 2510. This is not in the public domain. And fired here initiatives for general for refinery service are governed by API 560. Again, this is not in the public domain, so I can't provide you with a copy of those. There will, however, be more details of these guides and for advice, um, please consult Sean Moran's book. Let's think about control rooms. Control rooms are essential parts of a plant since this is where the operators, the people who run the plant, will be running their shifts and they are the first people to notice things going wrong. Operators will also go out and inspect plants every few hours or so, and so they need to be close enough to plants such that operators aren't discouraged from doing this. And a wealth of industrial experience suggests that between about 35 and 100 metres is around the right distance for a control room to a plant. Now, the counterpoint to this is that you need to keep control rooms as far away from plants as possible to reduce the level of hazard. So on one hand, you don't want to put them too far away since operators will never go and walk around the plant and spot things going wrong. On the other hand, you need to make sure that the operators are kept safe. So what you need to do is do some blast wave estimation. We've talked around um, blast wave analysis in the previous lecture. Think about the zones of damage that can be caused by a vessel rupture. And so control rooms should be placed upwind, first of all, of any items of toxicity. They should be blast protected. 
And so you're talking about blast walls, you're talking about firewalls. They should also be kept under slight positive pressure in case there's any release of toxic material. If the control room is under slight positive pressure with a treated air supply, then in the worst case, toxic material isn't going to leak into a control room. Air from a control room is going to leak out. And if that air has already been treated to be safe, then it guarantees that the operators are in a safe refuge at all times. Other things that you need to think about. You've got to think about reducing cost. Once you've addressed safety and operation, remember the economics because an economically unviable plant won't be built. So reduce the cost of construction by minimising your structural steelwork, by minimising your concrete, and where appropriate, and making sure that it's in line with all the correct legislation, the depth of your foundations. If structures are being used, they should support more than one item, ideally. Keep valves, instruments and other operator interactive items in safe and accessible locations close to the control room. And also don't forget maintenance. The picture I've put on my whiteboard is of a tube bundle from a heat exchanger being extracted during a maintenance operation. This is very, very common since you will often get significant tube side and shell side fouling in heat exchangers during process use. When the heat transfer reduces in these units to an unacceptable level, the plant is shut down, the tubes are pulled out and they're jet washed, either in situ on site or taken away to a third, lo third party location for that process to happen. Which means that if you've got a heat exchanger, you need to be able to draw out a tube bundle and to have enough space to do so. So if you haven't laid out your equipment to allow access to draw out a tube bundle, then essential maintenance operations simply will not be possible. Also, remember that if you've got particularly heavy items of equipment, you need to put them somewhere in construction. So on the whiteboard now, I've put a picture of a vacuum distillation column for a refinery. For a sense of scale, look at the car next to the lorry. That should give you an idea of how big these items of equipment are. So think about the construction of your plot. When items such as this are being delivered, where are they going to go before they're put into place? Also, when they're going to be when they are lifted into place, how are you going to lift them into place? Are they cantilevered up? Are they lifted in by crane? How are you going to ensure there's enough space to cantilever them up? Have you left enough space for crane access? And as an example, have a look at this photograph here of a part of a refinery complex during construction. Note the size of the cranes that are brought onto site. Note the big items of equipment that are being lifted into place. Note that there has to be the space both to lift them into place and also the space around where the item is eventually going to be placed to allow it to sit where it's going to sit. So let's recap a few key points. Plot layout starts by considering safety and emergency considerations. Don't forget that items of elevated level of hazard will require exclusion zones and the size of these exclusion zones are set out in law. Next, consider the process requirements. Specific guidance exists for vertical structures, for storage facilities, for hazardous facilities such as chlorine handling and so on and so forth. And where appropriate, I've tried to put guidance specific to these on Moodle for you. Keep your operators safe. Put the control room in the safest location that still affords ease of access to the plant. So it's going to be a compromise, but remember you can protect your control room. You can run them under positive pressure, you can protect them against blast, you can protect them against fire and you can protect them against shrapnel. They can be the safe refuge where people can safely deal with an emergency scenario. Never forget to overlook space required for maintenance and also for construction.